Okay, let's get started. Um, just a reminder, uh, please start in on your third and final interim video, um, which is you demonstrating uh, a second increment of your functionality and some nod that you've improved your system based on your user testing that you demonstrated to us in interim video two, which you all submitted last night, right? Awesome. Okay. Um, we'll talk briefly again uh, at the on the last class on Thursday about what to expect during the final project oral presentations. Any questions about the interim videos? All good? Okay. So we're working our way through this last theme in the course on looking inward, looking outward. We're, we, we're busy stitching technology into the physical world where that technology is directly sensing the real world and in some cases acting upon it. In this part of the course, we're looking at humans, which are looking increasingly inward into virtual environments, such as virtual reality, computer games, virtual worlds, and so on. Today, we'll be talking about augmented reality, where we still have a human who is observing the physical world. And as they move about in their physical environment, they are getting their expected sensory repercussions from their actions. But in addition, they're seeing virtual objects or entities overlaid on top. So they're interacting. Someone who is interacting with augmented reality is simultaneously interacting with a physical environment and a virtual environment, which raises interesting HCI-related challenges. We may or may not finish uh, Lecture 25 today, and we'll start in on cyborgs if we have time. OK. Uh, just to go back to Lecture 24, which we did not quite finish last time, we were looking at virtual worlds, and, uh, and other than computer games, what are they good for? We looked last time at um, possible educational applications of it. If we can teach people through uh, virtual worlds, what are sort of the additional affordances or opportunities, interactions that are possible in a virtual environment that would make learning easier, faster, less frustrating, and so on compared to doing everything in the real world? We looked at a clinical application last time for schizophrenia. Uh, if we want to treat patients that suffer from a mental disorder, one of the biggest challenges is not being able to understand what it feels like to suffer from that disorder. Can we create virtual realities, virtual worlds, where we can make it easier <coughs> for the public uh, or practitioners or students to actually see what it's like to suffer from that disorder? And we might actually be able to use it to treat patients by gradually tuning up the knob of this virtual environment that triggers some aspects of their uh, a mental disorder, allow them to then get comfortable with what they're seeing or experiencing, and then turn up the realism again, and hopefully systematically desensitize them to whatever visual and auditory hallucinations come along with schizophrenia, in this case. This turning up the knob of realism to systematically desensitize someone that suffers from schizophrenia might sound familiar to you. That process is something we've seen in many other guises already in this course. It is scaffolding, right? OK. We ended last time by uh, looking at a few snippets from uh, a, a, a legal document, an article written by a couple of legal scholars, which is, what is the legal status of objects and avatars in a virtual world? They're not real, so do they have value? Maybe yes, maybe no. Seems that in many cases, virtual objects do have value for the simple reason that people pay real money for them. What about avatars? If I kill your avatar in a virtual game, am I liable? I get, it depends on the rules set forth within the game. Like if it's a game where killing avatars is like what you do, right. you doesn't, doesn't seem like it, right? However, as some of you might have experienced, people tend to identify very strongly with their virtual presence or their virtual counterpart uh, in a game. So it may be possible, again, depending on the virtual world or the realism or the amount of time that somebody spends in that virtual environment where their avatar is them, they may suffer some emotional distress if you are to kill their avatar. So if there's emotional distress involved, maybe it's not murder, but maybe there is grounds for a legal case there. But I mean, like, by entering into a scenario where your avatar can be killed, you're implicitly giving consent to the fact that your avatar could be killed. 
Absolutely, right? So as everything in the law becomes increasingly complex, the more carefully you look at it, absolutely. If I know I'm entering a very violent video game and my avatar gets killed, I shouldn't be very surprised. But what about Second Life or some other virtual game where it's not so obvious what the rules are? Possibly, where does the responsibility lie? If I do something in a virtual world which would be illegal in the real world, where does the responsibility for that action lie? We're probably not going to answer that question today. The point here is that these questions are being asked, and they're becoming increasingly important. If you have somebody who spent thousands of hours developing their avatar in a virtual environment, that avatar is killed, and they cannot recover their avatar, there may, be a, there may be an issue there that might have a legal component to it. Kind of interesting to think about that. Okay, so this is the, the legal side. We've looked at education, uh, medicine, the law. What about finances? So this slide is a little bit dated, but I've kept it around just to sort of see how things change here. Second Life is maybe not the most popular uh, virtual world out there, but it was about 10 years ago, and it's still going. Um, back at the beginning, 2006, 2007, when it was just getting started, a few people built virtual uh, properties in there and became rich in this world. Um, you can go and read about Eileen Grief, the Rockefeller uh, of Second Life, kind of an interesting article about that. Um, now it's maybe not so surprising, but you can basically have a full-time job, a full-time career in a virtual world, buying, selling real estate, doing whatever you would do in the real world. Uh, kind of, kind of interesting. Here's a, here's two snapshots of the economy in Second Life back in 2007. 300 Linden dollars would buy you one uh, U.S. dollar. And again, there's the connection with the real world. I can pay real money and buy virtual money, and likewise, I can sell virtual money and get back real money. Which means things in that virtual world have value from a legal sense. 5.4 million total residents back in 2007. At any given time, there were 30,000 uh, people. Again, not so surprising these days. Lots of virtual worlds that have those kinds of communities. Back then, this was unprecedented. On that day, April 12, 2007, there were 2.1 million US dollars spent in a single day. So a pretty significant economy. Uh, it might be hard for some of you in the back to see, but this is a plot uh, of time going from October 2005 to December 2006. And the vertical axis here is US dollars in millions. The dark blue curve here is showing cash payouts. So the amount of actual US dollars that were being pulled out of that economy at the time. The fact that this is growing over time means that the economy in the virtual world itself is growing. Things that are being built or created inside that virtual world, their virtual value in the virtual world is increasing. And we know that because people would sell them off and retrieve more US dollars for whatever they put in to build this thing in the first place. A few years back, um, total residents were 30, uh, 36 million. And interestingly, I was able to find the Gini index for uh, Second Life at that time. If you've ever taken an economics or human development course, the Gini index is a measurement of uh, financial inequality. At this point in time, in the virtual world, uh, they took all the users that existed in that world and they, and they measured the amount of US dollars that each of those users had put into or pulled out of the world. And most of the residents, 90% of the residents together only accounted for 10% of the total economy of Second Life, where 10% of the residents accounted for the remaining 90%. It's quite a bit of inequality. Is, was Second Life at that time more or less uh, equal to the United States? What's the Gini index of the US? Does anybody know? Any, any guesses? 
which is worse? I think the U.S. has a higher. It has a higher. It has a, uh, actually a, um, it's. 0.7, I think, at the moment. So not as bad as second wife, but this is this is pretty bad. So there you go, kind of interesting. A bad, maybe it's a value judgment. Um, 2005, a few years back, uh, same thing, it's still going pretty strong. So uh, a total cash out from Second Life of 60 million US dollars, and Second Life had an estimated gross domestic product of 500 million US dollars higher than some small countries. How many of you before this lecture had heard of Second Life? Most of you? Okay. Not bad. Kind of interesting. And again, Second Life is clearly not the biggest virtual world that's out there at the moment. Kind of interesting to think about the underlying economies of these, these worlds. These are not just computer games off to the side. These are real economic actors in the global market. You remember at the beginning of this lecture, computer games taken together bring in much more money than, than Hollywood. It's a significant factor in the, in the global economy. Okay, interesting to think about. We talked about uh, schizophrenia. Here's another interesting uh, application of virtual reality for post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, PTSD. Um, this is work that was done uh, quite, a, quite a few years back uh, after some of the wars in the Middle East. This was work done by uh, a researcher that was using this for uh, US troops returning uh, from theaters of war, where again, they would instrument uh, these uh, subjects with virtual reality systems. There was actually a virtual uh, Humvee that they would sit in, and then they would gradually tune up the realism of this system. So initially, when uh, someone was placed in this environment, they felt that they were sitting in a vehicle. The vehicle wasn't moving. They were wearing goggles. They were looking from the point of view of the goggles through the windshield uh, of the vehicle to a featureless desert, and that was it. And unfortunately, for a lot of the participants, that was enough to trigger PTSD. They would sit quietly and wait until their vital signs returned to baseline. And then again, the clinicians would very gradually tune up the realism of the environment and gradually, through this process, put the patient back into the experience, the, the traumatic experience uh, of what triggered PTSD in the first place, allow them to gradually calm back down again, tune, tune up the realism, and so on. Right? Again, this idea of scaffolding or systematic desensitization. This is now a common tool uh, that's used in rehabilitation for various anxiety and PTSD related um, disorders. Okay, let's end here. Here's an in-class exercise, maybe not as dramatic as the other ones. Uh, you, go, you work for a company and they would like you to organize a team building virtual retreat. So you're going to bring together a lot of employees from the company. Everyone's gonna be in a virtual environment using virtual reality. And in this virtual retreat, we want to try and build trust among colleagues, foster collaboration, develop leadership skills of junior members of the company, build appreciation for one another's job within the organization, uh, and so on. So um, imagine this is a big company. There are a lot of people that work for this company. You may not have met some of them. Often you're working at cross purposes. Virtual retreat is an opportunity to try and bring people together, get to know one another, build trust, help one another, figure out what everyone does in the company and try and row in the same direction. That's the basic idea. Given what we've talked about in terms of virtual reality, but also our discussions about situated and embodied cognition, I want you to focus on that aspect, right? At the moment, we are all physically seated in the same room. I can see most of you. Some of you can see each other. There are a lot of physical interactions that are going on here. Can, how do we exploit those in a virtual world to work on some of these, uh, these issues? How would you organize an event in a virtual environment? What kinds of environments would you create to do this? How would this differ from a physical retreat? The company could pay and send everyone to a nice resort for a couple of days. What could you do differently or better in a system like this? Assume this is a multinational corporation. Some of these people may work in different countries in different time zones. They may speak different languages. They might have different cultural backgrounds. How do you get people to donate time and effort to this venture in the first place? 
Turn to your neighbor, maybe pick off a few of these questions and try and tackle them. I'll give you a couple minutes to discuss that and then we'll see what you came up with. Good luck. Okay, corporate virtual retreats. Sounds sounds like a lot of fun. What should we what should we do here? Ideas? We could have people switch roles in the organization for a day or half a day or something. Okay. And people will know who switched roles ah. because it's virtual reality. Very good. And that'll put people in lower positions, in higher positions, so they can build leadership skills and people in higher positions will understand what it's like to be below them. A great idea. So let's switch roles. So going back to this idea of trying to see something from the point of view of someone else. We're going to do that for this classroom. We're, you're going to make avatars of yourselves. I'm going to have an, an avatar and we're going to switch. You're not going to know who's the professor and who's the student. Might be an interesting way to understand the dynamics of a classroom a little bit better. Again, something that is difficult or impossible to do in reality. That's the idea. Perhaps virtual reality isn't the ideal application for this problem, but what can VR make easier that would be difficult or impossible to do in reality? That's that's what we're trying to get at here. Other ideas? Um, one thing we talked about was that because we have a bunch of people from different backgrounds and locations and stuff, um, they'd be familiar with different things. So if we put them all in a setting that no one would experience before, like Mars or Great, all right, so, so provide a novel challenge that, that challenges everyone, and maybe different parts of the people in different parts of the organization bring different skills to bear on the problem. It might level the playing ground. Yep, great idea. If you, for, to foster collaboration, if you were to give a task, and each individual was only given like one function, so they would all need to kind of collaborate because I need him for this, and we need her for that. Absolutely. Good idea. Yeah. Other ideas? Hello? Uh, we talked about how uh, currently, like, retreats and things like that, how uh, team building exercises work because you, uh, you have so much full attention. And, like, a lot of the time they, they go away and, like, take away our parts. And you might go to, like, a resort where it's, again, a new experience, but um, you also don't have so many distractions. And so I think having so much full attention is important. Absolutely, that's a great example. We want to try and bring people together to do this common exercise with as few distractions as possible. 
which may be easier or harder to do in a situation like this. My avatar is nodding, it's in full attention while I'm scrolling through my social media feeds, right? Who knows, but, but an interesting point, right? How could we build an environment like this if it's engaging enough, people might willingly set aside their other distracting devices and focus on what's going on, right? Perhaps it would be a little bit more fun to do this in a virtual environment that's a little more exciting than some, some other place. Other ideas? Yes? You could do like a virtual escape room. There you go. Everybody's all together and you gotta like solve tasks or something. Absolutely. So related to virtual reality and augmented reality is this idea of gamification, right? We might take something where most people might groan that they have to actually do this and try and make it fun and incentivize them with a challenge where everyone has to contribute. Maybe it's a novel situation that no one's experienced before. So people higher up in the company don't necessarily have any advantage in, this, in the challenge and, and so on. Great. Okay, let's move on to augmented reality now. So as mentioned before, uh, we are going to now assume in all of the applications we're gonna see in this lecture that the user is actually looking at and interacting with the real world. They are embedded in the real world. They are not losing themselves in a virtual environment, but we're trying to augment or add additional elements to the physical world to do X. This is actually an idea and even a technology that's been around since the late 1960s. There was this unwieldy sort of system here that would actually allow for a head-mounted display that could capture images from a camera and project them, although somewhat clumsily, on the inside surface of a pair of glasses. It's been around for a long time, this idea. But again, like virtual reality, it's only now, given improvements in hardware and software, that this is becoming something that's practical, real-time, uh, and, and plausible. This is an interesting excerpt from a research paper about augmented uh, reality. If you are looking at virtual objects, then the system needs to know what those objects look like from your point of view, and literally from your, the point of view of your eyes. I like this quote because there's only one way to capture stereoscopic video that matches real world perception, and that's to have the optical centers of the physical cameras located exactly where your eyes are. In order for the cameras to understand what you're seeing, they need to know exactly where you're looking. Without gouging out the user's eyes, this can only be achieved by folding the camera's light path as in this diagram. So we're not gonna gouge anyone's eyes out. That's probably not gonna be a very acceptable technology. So in this case, we have again two cameras because if you remember from last time, your eyes are actually registering slightly different images of the physical world. You would like the two cameras to capture exactly the same view that your eyes are capturing. That's the challenge here, right? Because the AR system is going to try and add virtual objects on top of the physical world, but it needs to know where to place those virtual objects from your point of view. It's actually a tricky problem to solve. In this application here, they're assuming they're gonna have some sort of uh, goggle or, or glasses set up where you have these uh, two partially, uh, partially transparent mirrors. So light that is coming in is hitting uh, the glass. Some of the photons are carrying on to your eyes as normal. Some of the photons are being deflected into uh, the lens of the camera. So the left camera and the user's left eye are seeing exactly the same scene. Make sense? <coughs> okay, so that's again input, and then we're gonna project virtual uh, elements back onto what you see. Here was one of the uh, earlier attempts to do this. This is the Magic Leap system. You'll notice in this video that the virtual objects are being occluded by physical objects. Very tricky to do unless you know exactly what the user is seeing.
Okay, this one is a little bit less interesting because there's no occlusion. Let me show the first scene again. How does the system know to erase this part of this little virtual creature here? Probably using two cameras for depth of field, and then it knows that if something's in front of it, it should include. A absolutely, right? So th there's 3D information here. So how this tabletop here, is it behind or in front of the 3D position of this virtual creature? Very tricky computational problem to solve. And one element of that is, again, being able to know exactly what the user is seeing from their point of view. OK. There's, there's different classes of augmented reality at the moment. Um, the simplest one is sort of GPS, right? We're going to assume that your, your phone is picking up latitude and longitude. And we know generally where you are. If you're looking then uh, through a camera, we can add in tags to that scene about information that's generally close by. This is easy because we're not assuming really that we know exactly what the user is looking at. They're in Harvard Square, so we can put up information about hardware and other uh, businesses that are close by. Sort of the simplest thing to do. Uh, the next thing up from that is marker-based uh, augmented reality, which has sort of been phased out now. So there was an initial idea to put QR codes everywhere so that when you're looking around with your AR goggles, they would recognize the QR code and be able to spring up information in your field of view. Not surprisingly, that wasn't a very acceptable solution. People weren't happy with people putting QR codes everywhere. So we moved sort of from marker-based AR to markerless AR, which is now we're going to have to rely not just on cameras and inference about where someone is looking, head position, head orientation, head velocity as someone is moving. We're also going to have to infer information about what they're seeing in reality. So uh, obviously, this is uh, not quite a physical scene, but imagine that this is a physical scene. And we wish to have these detailed tags added onto this physical scene. Some of these pieces of information are relatively easy to obtain. You pick them up from GPS or, or Google Maps, given the, the human's location. Other elements here are much more difficult to infer. And where to place them in this two-dimensional image, also tricky. Which elements here are easier and which are more difficult? Absolutely, right? So again, thanks to the deep learning revolution and big data, it's getting easier for a system to look at that and say that that element in this scene is a bike rack, but still pretty challenging. Yes? Uh, cars or anything that moves? Sorry? Anything that moves? Anything that moves cars. are cars. If you are in an urban environment, that's a problem. That's maybe a pretty good uh, first guess. Being able to tell the volume of that brick building on the way. Yes, the, the cubic meters of the building. I'm not quite sure where that information came from. We're pulling something out of Google Maps and then going to look at another data set, perhaps. Uh, knowing the different functions of buildings. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think, they, again, this is sort of a concept picture. I think they're, that's sort of a nod to the fact that we're going from where the user is, going into Google Maps, pulling out information from there, and then using that to go look up information in some other data source, right? What else is difficult here? This is my favorite killer app of augmented reality. Imagine as you walk around in your environment, you never have to see a billboard again. Luckily in Vermont, you don't really have to see many billboards anyways. It's ad blocker for real life, kind of an interesting idea. Let's focus on this one. How did it know that that was an advertisement rather than a traffic sign, for example, which you may want to see? Did it have to reference, like, know that it's a picture of something and then reference every, like, company out there. And then you, work for, you work for the company that's developing this AR system, and you're prototyping an ad blocker for real life. 
given what you know about HCI, how would you approach this problem? I was going to say something a bit different. Okay. Um, how it would be super difficult to determine whether it was an ad versus like a logo for like VCs or something. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Tricky, right? How could we make this distinction? Could it have a database of what the current advertisements are on billboards? Maybe. So people can know if it's an actual advertisement or not, and then they save to the cloud, other people will get that information. That would be the first good attempt, right? Is there a data set out there that's registering what ad is currently being shown on the corner of X Street and Y Avenue? Um, you could have users tag ads as they see them. Absolutely, right? So why don't we pull in some crowdsourcing? People are probably incentivized to work together on this problem. That might make things easier. Tell us exactly the corner of. Is it on the second floor, the third floor? How much information can a user visually infer from the scene? How much are they willing to actually type in or tap on a screen? How much information can we get? Should make the job a lot easier than trying to go and find that information in some other data source or try and infer whether it's an ad directly using computer vision algorithms from the scene itself. Absolutely, right? So you could create a simple app where you just lasso the ad in your visual scene. Margaret? Absolutely. And, and perhaps we bring together all of these approaches and they corroborate one another. There's also like a lot of cities will do just like big murals and like art pieces where there used to be like billboards on the sides of buildings. And so yeah. some people might be like, dang, my ad blocker is blocking these cool art pieces. Absolutely, that I right? Even know there because they're false, false positives. Tricky, right? Again, we're, this is now thinking about the physical context of an urban setting, right? What are the confounding factors like, uh, like a large mur mural that might make, assuming we're not crowdsourcing the problem, make it difficult to identify whether there's an ad in my field of view or not? I think like reading some of the language on ads, this would not cover all situations for the ad, but if you identify we're only with a dollar sign next to it and a number, like only at this price. That might capture quite a bit. Yep. But I think what's also tough is often, I don't personally, when I'm walking around, I do like to see on stores like if there's a sale or something. Exactly, right? It depends on context. It doesn't necessarily mean you'd want to turn on your ad blocker at all times. It could possibly mix up 3D images for things that are ads of that thing. Absolutely. That would be a problem if there's yep. an ad for a certain type of you don't want that to be blocked out on the road. Absolutely, yeah, exactly. So some false positives may be more uh, dangerous than others. Um, also, it's really important to get depth right, because if there's an ad, but it's behind like a stop sign, you don't want the ad blocker to you know, block the stop sign. Yeah. So now we've moved from thinking about how to recognize ads to, again, the context surrounding this problem. Imagine you're wearing AR glasses, and as you can see in this, picture here, maybe it's not that obvious, this person is driving. So if we're creating an app where it's autonomously going to black out parts of your field of view without warning you, now we're, we've moved very far from thinking about advertisements to thinking about the conditions under which this app should be allowed to operate. Remember back to the beginning of the course, we talked about blocking teens out of texting while driving, right? So now we're in that sort of territory again, which makes AR an interesting HCI application. It's not just about recognizing ads, it's thinking about the larger context here. Yes? Yeah, I think like one thing you have to consider is, is a green square preferable to an actual ad? It's like, so you're still having that part of your vision disrupted either way. Uh, it may not, it may be perfectly bug free, but it may not be acceptable to users. Right? And there's only one way to test acceptability. Prototype this as people walk, bike, ride, skateboard, every mode of transport you can think of through a downtown core and see whether this, this works or not. Just think about like online ad blockers right now. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if like a store won't take you in if you're blocking their ads. Ah, interesting. Websites that like, hey, you're blocking your ads. You can't come in. 
Yeah. Absolutely, yes. And like, how does that translate to your life? Okay. Interesting to think about. There's also a, the question of like different ads are relevant to different people, so it might be possible that you know different people that are using your AR want to block only certain types of ads. So there's like the question of adding that type of functionality to. Absolutely. And I don't want to block ads when I'm driving, but when I'm walking, yes. And I don't want to have to manually enter whether I'm driving or walking. I want you to use activity tagging, which we talked about a few weeks back, to infer what I'm doing and turn on or off my ad blocker depending on that. I mean, it'd be pretty easy to tell whether you're driving or walking because like, large objects will be moving at 25 miles an hour if you're walking. Okay. If you're driving. Okay. Steering wheel, yep. What are some other elements in this scene or others that you could imagine in an urban setting like this that may be more difficult to infer than others? I feel like uh, marking entrances can be pretty difficult because a lot of the times it could just be like employees only or an emergency exit. Absolutely, right? So an entrance, this is basically an affordance, right? And it affords the fact that you can go from outdoors to indoors. But that is a tricky thing to actually, once you start to get into it, is it actually an entrance? Is it an entrance to a car garage? Is it, is it open to pedestrians? Again, this is something that we infer all the time as we walk around in a complex urban environment. If you think about trying to automate that process, for a lot of these, it becomes pretty challenging. One thing that might be tricky is if it bases it on a database, if the landscape changes or something, so like the new building goes up, or they decorate for Absolutely. So we're focusing on urban settings and the rate of construction, the rate of change in an urban setting is higher than in a small town or a rural setting. There's just more construction, more things change faster, which means those elements are more probable, which means we should be thinking about is this AR system being used in an urban setting or somewhere else. Uh, to kind of go off of that, really big visual changes, like if it snows a lot in that area, we have to know what the thing Absolutely. This is already challenging for autonomous vehicles, which are only restricted to thinking about the road in front of them. If we're thinking about a pedestrian moving through an urban environment, there is much more of that environment that may or may not be relevant. So there's different strategies. We might try and infer, infer what the person is doing and restrict this tagging to elements that we think are relevant to what they're doing. That can become challenging because we may infer what they're doing incorrectly, and we may incorrectly infer what they want to see under those situations. Yep, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, also, there's back to autonomous cars. They have um, they're having trouble right now detecting the difference between things like potholes and things like puddles. So, like pothole was on there, and that would be another thing that would be like, pretty difficult to detect. How do you detect a pothole? Uh, city plan. City plans, possibly. Um, I don't know specifically what the actual wavelength or level would be, but you could send something through that. And, I mean, just in terms of uh, like, infrared, maybe. Oh, I see from the cameras themselves. Something that would bounce back. Absolutely. We'll, water we'll put some leap motions on the, uh, on the goggles pointing forward. We, we, could, we could do something like that, right? We could, we could assume additional sensing on uh, the technology, but we want to sell these things, so we don't want them to become too expensive. <coughs> what else might we do? I, I don't know the name of the app, but I've heard of this app that um, incentivizes reporting potholes and other traffic obstructions, and that if you, if you report them on your drive to work, you'll get points and you get better routes. I don't know the points that you, but uh, you could just have other people all using the same system reporting the potholes. Absolutely. So let's assume that we're going to have people driving cars reporting the potholes. I don't know how many of you drove to campus this morning. You, you experienced those potholes. How, do, how might want a driver report a pothole? We prefer them, obviously, not to take their hands off the steering wheel and type in an app where they experienced the pothole. Is there a better way we can do this? Audio detection. What's that? Audio. Audio detection? So like you say potholes. Okay, possibly. The minute I hit a pothole, I just say it, and my phone picks it up and marks where I was when I said it. Getting closer. 
If you drove in this morning, I can tell you, I certainly did from Jericho, you feel them, your car feels them, you have an accelerometer on your phone, especially in an urban setting, again, where we have enough traffic. If we're doing it from accelerometer data, we might get a lot of false positives. Again, if there's a lot of snow or ice, the car is moving quite a bit. It's very difficult for one car to determine where a pothole is. If we're going to do it directly from accelerometer data. But if we have enough people using this app and a large number of cars, when they're exactly at that GPS location, register more acceleration and deceleration than baseline, that's the pothole. So again, the users who are driving, we prefer not to distract them from driving, can autonomously register where the pothole is. And if it's accelerometer data, that's useful because we're getting it at exactly the position where the pothole is. If I have to say pothole, I'm usually saying it about five or 10 feet beyond where the pothole actually is, right? Again, physical context of a car driving over a pothole. You could combine the two also. Like uh, if the user says it, you say, well, I detected it back here. That uh, must be what they were absolutely. And again, not that any one solution is best. We might corroborate a bunch of these orthogonal approaches to inferring the position of a pothole. Well, one thing about that is that if you use that up and down data, it would require people to drive over potholes, and a lot of people like to avoid them. Ah, exactly. So then you'd have to find Possibly, but again, this is good thinking about human behavior around a pothole. Even if most people are swerving around the pothole, and we know that, how can we use that fact to determine where the pothole is? Because a lot of people swerve in the exact same place. Absolutely. If people are swerving <laughs> slightly outside of the lane at exactly this position, more often than not, there's, it may not be a pothole, but there may be some obstruction there. It's also a lot harder to dodge bottles in urban areas than it's like in Vermont. Possibly. In the urban areas, most of them. Again, it depends on where we are, right? You can imagine a rural setting where, again, cars tend to dodge at a certain position for a couple of hours and then they stop doing so. It's not a pothole. Maybe a traffic cone, roadkill, something else that's temporary, right? If it's swerving for a squirrel, it's not a bunch of cars that are going to swerve at exactly the same position. We're assuming that we're taking some statistics across multiple cars, because any one, any one car is not going to give us sufficient data to train a machine learning algorithm to recognize a pothole, for example. Unless the squirrel stays in the same spot. <laughs> there you go. We're in Vermont, exactly. Who knows what's going on on the road? You never know. Makes things interesting. Okay, I think we've more than made our point here, right? AR is interesting because, again, there are a lot of these subtle HCI elements. Some of them are easy. We can tag, we can tag uh, elements using Google Maps and we're done. But others require us to think very deeply about the kind of human behavior that's relevant to that object or entity and process. And can we not just... Can we exploit that human behavior, assuming that the humans are carrying around smartphones, to infer the positions of these elements? Okay. I mean, we're going to finish this lecture with an application. This is from a research project uh, that myself and Professor Hines in electrical engineering uh, have been working on, which has an augmented reality component to you. So I'll just walk you through this, this project and why we used augmented reality in this case. Project, uh, we nicknamed this Wiki Innovation. So the idea here is to, again, bring a bunch of people together. So this is also a crowdsourcing application to collaboratively try and design new energy harvesting devices. So in Western countries, for wind power, it typically makes sense to create very large towers and turbines. But in developing countries where there isn't that infrastructure, it may be better to create very low cost do-it-yourself wind power collectors. And there are a lot of different ways to do this. One of them is this interesting concept of what's known as a wind belt. And I'll let, uh, I'll let the inventor explain it to you. The breakthrough was how to get away from wind generators that spin. Everyone up till now has been trying to shrink 
turbines. I first started thinking about this in middle school and first saw the Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapse. It's the bridge that starts to shake and wobble. The effect is known as aeroelastic flutter. You can think of it kind of like the bow of a musical instrument, the bow of a violin. When air blows across the surface, it starts to vibrate with the wind at a pretty high frequency. So this is the first approach that uses flutter. You need a way to convert the power in flowing air or wind into the movement of something else. This involves just a few components. You have tension membrane or belt. Think of this kind of as a flexible lever. The second thing you need is a way to convert that motion into electricity. That leverage moves this button magnet. We've designed some very simple cost a quarter kind of power conditioning units. There's nothing really too special about the material. Mylar coated taffeta. This is actually a kite making material. There's enough here for hundreds of wind belts. It was originally designed to address rural lighting in Haiti, thinking how can you make a wind generator for two to five dollars with turbine technology? It was impossible. When you shrink turbines, you have to contend with slick, expensive bearings. We can get 10 times the efficiency because there's no bearings in the wind belt at all. Also turned out that there is just no micro wind options on the market at all. Imagine if wind power is 10 times cheaper than it is now. You can imagine a totally different way of looking at macro size wind power. Strips of material that span a gap, you know, a valley, just have those under a high tension and you can cull the energy out of the wind. Harder problems make for better inventions. Those problems force you to think in a new way and can yield new inventions that can serve the whole world, not just developing countries. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. So this, these are micro wind, uh, micro wind systems. So very low wind conditions, something you might experience outside your window, two to five dollars of material, uh, a non-expert can construct this, and away you go, right? That's, that's the idea. Obviously, if we wanted to scale this up, you'd have to have thousands or tens of thousands of participants building thousands or tens of thousands of these and trying to individually take themselves partly uh, or completely off the grid or in developing countries there may be no grid at all and what they're interested in is providing lighting uh, during the night or other simple low power applications that's the idea okay so this wind belt technology as was pointed out here you take a very thin pliable piece of material in this case it was kite making material you can do the same thing with a bike tire Tighten it, uh, tauten it, take any kind of meta, metal container, doesn't really matter, any kind of uh, metal uh, surrounder. Tighten it uh, and connect it at the ends. And then uh, in the video there, you might have noticed there were uh, small uh, magnets that were placed on either end. And connect those magnets with wires to the light, the clock, what have you. If the wind is coming in at just the right uh, speed, you get this aeroelastic flutter. It starts to vibrate at a very high frequency, which vibrates the magnets back and forth. And if you wrap wire around either end, you have a magnet that is moving very quickly within this coil of wire, which will induce a current, and off you go. So far, so good? OK. The question, however, is what kind of material? How tightly should it be uh, stretched? How big should this metal container be? How many rounds of coil should be added? The answer is nobody really knows. So why don't we try instead to crowdsource this solution? So in the Wiki Innovation uh, Project, this is the idea would be to create a wiki. And any individual page in this wiki site is a set of instructions about how to build one of these things, how to build a wind belt. So buy some material from vendor one or go and find a bike tire, uh, purchase some magnets from here uh, or whatever, and these might be local sources. And then instructions about how to cut the band, tighten it, add the magnets, uh, wire the copper wire, uh, coil the copper wire around either ends and off you go. In this particular example here, the instructions are to cut it so that it's two inches wide at the end and three inches wide at the midpoint. So a perfectly flat 
rectangular cross section may not be the best way to do things. Maybe an oval, maybe a sinusoidal pattern might make sense. Who knows? Let's say you create this wind belt. You put it outside your window. You plug in your cell phone and you see how many hours it takes to charge your cell phone. Doesn't do very well. You bring the device back in and you cut a new piece of material. You take another bike tire and cut it in a different shape. Put that outside the window and it charges your phone faster. You tell your friends about that innovation by copying this wiki page and making a new page and changing the instructions. You edit the instructions so that the next person who visits the site can see two different versions of a wind belt and they decide which version to build and off you go. Okay, so we start to have a growing number of different versions of the wind belt. Which version do you build if you're new to the site? Imagine you have a set of visualizations, like for example, you might uh, connect this application with your social network and see that a couple of your friends have tried this out as well. So you're gonna try and build some designs based on your friends. You might come up with your own wind belt design, put it on the wiki site, and a couple weeks later, you see that people in different countries have adopted your idea and further innovated upon it. So you create a different, or you pull up a different visualization where your design sits at the root of a design tree. All of the nodes that are below you are other people that have adopted your design and modified it. And the nodes below that are in improvements on that design and so on and so forth. Did you have a question? Yeah, is this something that can be like simulated? Uh, actually asking people to do to physically build them. Good question, yeah, right? An engineer simulate this in an environment and still have the machine learning. Uh, exactly. So we haven't talked about are they actually building this in reality or a virtual environment? We'll get to that in a moment. So we have this idea and we want to try and obviously incentivize people to participate. It's going to be tricky because they're going to have to buy parts. It's not that expensive, but still they might have to financially invest in this. It's a fair bit of effort to make one of these things, put it outside your window, report back how many hours it took your device to charge your cell phone, and so on. So how do we make this a little bit easier on people? The idea here is to first is to do this in three stages. The first one is virtual reality. We, we have a virtual simulation. You don't actually physically make one of these things. We have a little bit of a simulator and you can try out different designs in the simulator. The problem, however, with the simulator, especially for this application, is that you need a very realistic simulation of airflow in order to simulate aeronautic flutter. It's a very difficult thing to do. State-of-the-art airflow simulators run slower than real time. So if you simulate this, it's gonna take longer to simulate a design than it would to build it and test it in reality. So simulation or virtual reality isn't a good solution here. So, the net, so the, we could, of course, just ask them to build it and try it out in reality, but is there somewhere that is somewhere in between? And that's the augmented reality idea. So in this case, the user is going to try out a virtual wind belt in a physical environment. So imagine we ask them to tie a wind sock or a literal sock or anything that flows to a tree outside their window, point a camera at their window, and collect a live feed of what's seen outside the window and display that on their laptop. So the user is now looking at their laptop and they're just watching the scene outside their window. And given the flutter of the, the sock, we know direction and we know quite a bit about airflow, which means we don't have to simulate airflow itself. Simulators are not very good at that, they're very slow. So we're going to infer that in this sort of cheap way. And then they're going to take their virtual design and put that in the system. So when they're looking at their laptop, they're looking at a physical scene, and they're looking at a virtual version of their design, and they can see how well this system does in the actual wind conditions outside their window. 
right? They still haven't had to actually build something yet. They might try and create virtual versions of different designs that are available to see which ones are best for the wind conditions where they live. They might then choose an actual design by the parts and build it and now try it in reality. So again, scaffolding. We want to incentivize people to participate, but they might not immediately be incentivized to shell out some money and time to participate. So let's start with virtual reality, then augmented reality, then reality, reality. That's the idea. We haven't been able to convince the government to fund this project yet. If any of you have 300,000 kicking around, we would love to chat with you more about this idea. Okay. Okay, that's augmented reality. Uh, we've got 15 minutes left, so let's start in on cyborg technology. Like the other technologies we've seen uh, so far in the last two lectures, this idea of cy uh, cyborgs or cybernetic technology has again been around for a long time. Um, going back uh, to the 1940s, Norbert Wiener was the first cybernetician. So cybernetics is again this idea uh, of devices that perform something based on feedback. So the field of cybernetics was born at the same time as computers and robots. The focus in cybernetics is this idea of feedback, which means all these years later, now that cybernetic technology is becoming a reality, it's a very good fit for HCI because HCI's fundamental ideas, all of the ideas in HCI are based on feedback. Okay. So according to Wiener, um, he, he imagined, again, this was way too early to actually do this, nervous prostheses. So you know what a prosthesis is, right? So this is something that replaces a lost limb, a lost leg, a lost hand, a lost arm. What is a nervous prosthesis? A nervous prosthesis is something that is going to talk directly to the nervous system. So if you have a prosthetic, let's imagine it's a non-technological one, you have a wooden leg, you move your leg, you move, the, you move your hip, which moves your wooden leg, your wooden leg comes into contact with the ground, and you feel that at the hip. There is communication between your non-technological prosthetic and your nervous system, but it's at the point of connection, right? I'm sending commands from my brain down through my spinal cord to my hip, I'm contracting the muscles in my hip, which moves my prosthetic. My prosthetic then experiences something in the real world and communicates that information back to the sensory systems that I have in my hip. And those sensory signals are again sent back up the spinal cord to the brain. And we have this feedback loop, but it is the point of, of disconnect is down at the place of the prosthetic. Imagine a nervous prosthetic where the intervention, the point at which signals go from the brain to the prosthetic and back is further and further upstream. That's what a nervous prosthetic is. So um, we're gonna try and bypass neural pathways where normally those neural pathways would receive signals directly from the brain, like the muscles ar around my hip and pass them, uh, sorry, directly from the brain and pass them directly to the muscles. Perhaps I have a spinal injury. I can't send signals from my brain to my leg. I want a cybernetic device that can take commands from the brain and pass them on to the muscles and vice versa. Devices now exist that support feedback in the other direction, pick up signals from the sense organs and deliver them directly to the brain. Okay, let's have a look at what this looks like. Here's our normal cartoon here. We have a user that is providing input to a computer and vice versa. We're going to now explode this cartoon into multiple elements. So our intelligent agent is now these five components here. But like before, our human is interacting with their environment. Because we are embodied agents, we interact with the environment using our muscles. We push against the world. And then we observe how the world pushes back using our sense organs. Okay. 
Imagine that we have a subject in which communication is broken down between the brain and the muscle. We have uh, someone who has a spinal cord injury. We cannot send signals from the brain to the muscles. So we're going to implant a cybernetic device in the middle. Or again, we have a sense organ and it is impossible for that sense organ to send its information back to the brain. So we place a cybernetic device in the middle that directly collects signals from the sense organ and sends it to the brain. That is one, uh, one kind of nervous prosthetic or cybernetic device. This assumes in this case that we're dealing with subjects in which the sense organs and muscle groups are still working. It's the communication between those systems and the brain that's not working. Arlo? So because these, um, because you're just getting signals and you're sending them somewhere else, you like have a cybernetic device on your body and then prosthetic arm somewhere else entirely like three miles away and have that information being relayed in real time and control of your arm all the same? Absolutely, that's possible. It, it's been done. We haven't got to the prosthetic arms and legs yet, right? In this case, we're assuming the patient has their arms and legs. They just cannot communicate with them. They cannot send signals to their legs, and they cannot, for example, collect sensory information back from their leg. I'm just a bit confused how this, how cybernetics is different than robotics, which also takes some amount of feedback from the environment. The, an the answer is there is no clear dividing line. In a cybernetic device, cybernetics, or cyborgs if you like, we're assuming there is a collection of technological and biological components, but it is still, in this case, the human that's in charge. Right? In a robot, we have a separate device which has a mind of its own. Right? In this case, it is a human which is directly trying to control their body with the help of cybernetic devices, usually which are implanted not on the skin, but under the skin. If you have a spinal cord injury and the brain cannot talk to the muscles in the legs, you're going to usually have to have something that is surgically implanted and is collecting messages directly from the brain and passing them on to the muscles in the lower extremities. Okay. Again, this assumes that our subject in this case has an intact musculature and sense organs. What happens if, again, they're missing limbs? So we want to now have prosthetics. So there is no muscle group to talk to. We want to send, we now want to send signals directly from the brain to the cybernetic device, which causes action in the real world. So we are skipping over missing limbs or missing muscle groups. We have the brain, which sends a command to a cybernetic device, which sends commands to a prosthetic. We can assume that this is the prosthetic itself. The prosthetic arm or leg moves, has some impact on the environment. That environment, in turn, impacts the device. I hit the table with my prosthetic arm, and my prosthetic arm registers that touch collects that information, and sends it directly to my brain. So I am not actually moving any of my own body parts or collecting information back from them. In this subset of cybernetic technology, this is now known as brain-computer interaction. Right? These two cybernetic devices are computers. It is the brain talking directly to a computer or a robot which acts on the world and reports the result of that action back to the brain directly. In, lecture, uh, in this lecture, we're going to start by looking at these downstream technologies, and we're going to move to these upstream cybernetic technologies. And the first set of uh, examples we're going to see, all the patients and subjects you're going to see have a somewhat intact uh, muscle, uh, muscle groups and sense organs. They're having problems communicating between these two systems. Okay, let's start with that. First system we're going to look at, and this might be the only one we look at today, this is the Lokomat system. Um, I actually helped work on this when I was doing my graduate studies uh, in, in Zurich, Switzerland. This is a robot, so it's a prosthetic device that is wearable. Actually, I'll start the video and talk over it for you. 
So in this case, uh, we have a paraplegic um, inability to send commands to his lower extremities. As you can see, uh, his arms work just fine. We're going to uh, instrument him with the locomot, which is a robot. And when he is wearing the locomot, during uh, periods of physical rehabilitation, the locomot is going to walk the subject. The robot is going to do all the work while the subject does nothing. But while the subject is passively being walked by the locomot, the locomot is going to move the subject's legs through the motion of walking. And the subject's body is going to feel that result. Right? So they're going to re-experience the experience of walking, although they are not the ones that are doing the walking. It's the locomot that they're wearing. This is early on in rehabilitation. Again, when they are not doing the walking, locomot is doing the walking. What do you think happens in subsequent rounds of physical therapy with this device? Scaffolding. Scaffolding, exactly. Every time the subject comes in uh, to the clinic for another round of rehabilitation, the locomot does less work. We tune down the strength of the motors, it becomes more compliant, compliant meaning that it's more and more passive, it takes more and more direction from the motion of the subject's legs, until, or as we go as far as we can get, if we're lucky, the subject at the end is walking the locomot rather than the other way around. Basically, it becomes just a passive uh, set of, uh, uh, a passive truss, just passively being worn by the subject. Speed this up a little bit. So you can see there's a lot of support here. Uh, there's actuation or movement of the subject's upper legs. You'll notice this system down here on the feet. What is the system on the feet doing? I'm sorry that the patient has the proper gait. Has the proper gait, right? So as you walk, when your foot lifts the ground, you have to lift your toes or else your toes will hit the ground and you'll stumble. So there are a lot of large and small movements that go into bipedal or two-legged walking that the locomot has to get right. We need to be able to generate a familiar experience, right? What it's like to actually walk. It's obviously not perfectly familiar because you're wearing this big beast on your back, but we can get as close as we can. So again, we're combining now robotics, scaffolding. Uh, this is not quite cybernetic technology because again, the subject is still wearing this device. But it is a cybernetic device that is helping reconnect the brain to the lower extremity muscle groups. Right? It's on the skin. We've got time for this next one. This one is similar. This one is now for uh, subjects who have suffered a stroke. Um, for a lot of people that suffer a stroke and recover from the stroke, they then suffer from uh, muscle synergy. So muscle synergies is the fact that your brain has lost the ability to independently actuate different parts of the body. Someone who has a stroke, if you ask them to uh, move, they will flex all of the muscles in their arm and hand, for example, or leg, depending on the nature of the stroke. So they cannot move their hand and not move their arm or vice versa. Everything moves together. And it is extremely difficult to provide physical therapy to undo muscle synergies. Very, very difficult to teach someone how to move uh, their muscles independently again. So like the locomot, this is going to be a wearable technology, a wearable prosthesis. So this is uh, a year and a half after stroke, and here you can see the muscle synergy. So they're flexing their shoulder, bicep, tricep, wrist, hands, all together. So strong flexion synergies, flexing all the muscles, drawing uh, the arm up.
So the device, like the locomat, is now uh, wearing the human. The device is holding, is trying to hold the shoulder and the bicep still and allowing them just to move the tricep. And it is not influencing the wrist or the hand in this case. So again, the patient is re-experiencing what it's like to move different muscle groups independently of one another. Once the brain starts to get that sensory information again, once it remembers how to do it, it's easier for the brain to reteach the muscles how to do it without the device. So you can still see some of the synergies here, but they're definitely greatly reduced uh, after use of the device. And I think there's one more. Again, not 100%, but, but much better than, than before. OK, we'll pause there. We've looked at cybernetic devices over the skin. Uh, on Tuesday, we'll look at devices under the skin. You have a quiz due tonight, and you're now working on interim video three. Have a good rest of your day.